kind of prepare your hearts for worshiping our God today, you may do that too. Try 
great way to start by remembering God's love for us. Isn't that great? Thank you so much. We're so blessed to have uh, this group as our musicians to get us started in worship. I um, have a lot of announcements to go over uh, with you today. And you can read some of these in your um, bulletin as well. But uh, Awana is growing. We've had uh, some new kids show up, and so we could use some extra help uh, in Awana. I know we need a person to assist with the girls' uh, book time. That would be real helpful. And then also we have the weekly uh, council times or speakers just for a 10 or 15 uh, minute message. It can be a one-time thing. If you wanted to sign up uh, for that, that would be very helpful. So we're encouraged about that. Also, I was going, going to point out, uh, and just a reminder, we have these uh, truelife.org cards uh, that you can pick up uh, in the lobby as well. It's, it's a website with a lot of great things about different topics. Uh, that people are interested in going on in our culture. Uh, they can get a Christian perspective on some of these things. So, And also on the back, it's just got our church information. You invite them to church as well. So just want to remind you to uh, pick those up and keep handing those out. We've seen uh, some good uh, results as far as that goes too. Next in your bulletin, um, there's an announcement about um, Dave Moody, who used to come to our church, Dave and Connie Moody. Uh, he is a pastor now in uh, Broken Bow, Nebraska, excuse me, Burwell, and uh, he's with the Rural Home Mission Association, I believe that's what it is, but they're going to have a work opportunity coming up in the next couple of weeks. I don't have the date uh, written down here, but uh, they're going to be working on their home and just trying to do some fixing up on it. And um, if you can help with that, if you'd uh, talk to Bill or Ken or Jane Daberko about that, I know they'd appreciate uh, some help there. Another opportunity to serve is with our international students. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet for uh, meals there. If you could help prepare a meal for that, that would be a wonderful blessing uh, for that. This last week we had uh, seven international students come and I uh, had a great time uh, sharing the gospel with them and uh, just going through some Bible study there again. How would you like a reminder to pray uh, during the day? Uh, some of you have uh, smartphones and uh, can get a reminder here. There's a ministry out that, that has a special prayer app that you can put on your phone and it'll actually remind you to pray. It's based on... Um, Corinthians, set first, first Chronicles, excuse me, I think 7.14, uh, where it talks about prayer. And so it'll remind you at 7.14 in the morning and 7.14 in the evening to pray for our nation. Things. And we do have a short video explanation on this that we're going to review here.
Looks like a pretty neat little app you can put on your phone there. I encourage us to pray. If you want some more information, there is an insert in your bulletin. You can read about that and sign up for that. Then the, the last thing I wanted to um, announce was that um, we are going to have a uh, outreach this Halloween that's coming up on the 31st. And um, we have a rental property in Norfolk here. It's at 207 North Cottonwood, and it's not rented. And so uh, we're going to use that as an outreach uh, for Halloween, uh, this particular house. And we're going to call it an All Saints house instead of uh, Halloween. And uh, what we're going to do is um, uh, have some games in the yard, have some uh, different colored light tosses and beanbag toss and games. There's going to be prizes, of course, candy we're going to give out. But we're just praying for uh, 50 or more kids uh, to come by uh, on this night. Uh, we're certainly going to share the gospel with them. We're going to have some gospel booklets uh, that they can take with them. And in addition to that, uh, we're going to be, if the weather's nice, we're going to show uh, the Jesus film for children uh, right in the parking lot, or not in the parking, in the uh, driveway there. And uh, that'll be going on, and hopefully this will draw a crowd and a lot of interest there. Uh, we'll also uh, be inviting them to Awana, uh, and we have some flyers to hand out for Awana. Uh, there's a lot of kids uh, in this neighborhood. And so if you can help with this, uh, we would encourage you to um, uh, pray for this, for sure, uh, that God will use this and, and we'll be able to reach some people with the gospel. But also, uh, if you can help, if you feel like you'd like to help with these, this outreach and come to it, that would be great. And then also, if you can uh, maybe bring some baked goods, uh, some cookies, uh, some other snacks or candies or something, we do have a sign-up and um, uh, the lobby there for that as well. So uh, again, that'll be in a, in a couple weeks is, is Halloween actually. So in a couple weeks from now, uh, we'll be just collecting some of that too. A lot of announcements, a lot of good things going on here. Uh, Psalm 138, I read this week and it says this, I will give thanks with all my heart and I will sing praises to thee before the gods. What a great way to think about what a verse to think about as we start our worship time with him. So let's open with a word of prayer and praise him. Father, we do thank you so much for the fact that you are working. You're working in our lives. You're working in other people's lives. And uh, we see your hand uh, ministering. Thank you for allowing us to be a small part of that work. We praise you for your goodness. We praise you that you are alive and well that you're a comforter, you're a guide, and that we can have a relationship with you, Lord. Thank you for reminding us of your deep love for us. Help us now as we come into this hour to praise you, to honor you, and to get to know you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's do stand and greet one another as we begin. <laughs> Good morning, Max. <laughs> Okay, Mike. Thank you. 
may be seated. The ushers are going to come forward and we're going to continue in worship in the giving of tithes and offerings and of giving your heart to Him. As we continue in this song, this great God of ours, He knows our name. steal it from Terry Duffy again and start with good morning family. Thank you Terry. Appreciate that. Yes. All right. So I have the privilege of uh, reading the scripture for this morning and um, I'm glad that I get to do this because this has some of the, my favorite verses in this entire book. Uh, not just the book of Galatians but this Bible here. So uh, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Uh, Galatians 4, 1 through 11. Now, I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is a master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ." But then, indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn against the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? 
You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. It's caught. Just a moment. There we go. <clears throat> Good to see all of you this morning. Welcome. Let's pray. Lord, we're excited this morning to be able to open up again your word. We ask. In many ways, Lord, we plead. For your blessing. We really need to hear from you in the midst of the chaos and confusion of this world. It's so easily in this day to be discouraged. But we thank you, Lord, that we have the victory in Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that we know who holds the future. That we don't have to fear or be afraid. We walk in confidence, not because of who we are, but because of who you are and what you've done for us. And so we ask now your blessing on this time, this special time, that we get to open up your word together. Minister, Lord, we pray as only you can. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you have a will? Do you have a will? Now, some of you would say, well, I don't have enough money to even have a will. And that's, that could be true, but there are other reasons to have a will. One of the reasons to have a will is to give testimony of your faith in Jesus Christ. That even after you've gone home to be with the Lord, you can share with people your confidence in Christ, the assurance of salvation in Jesus. So that's certainly a great reason to have a will. Another very important reason to have a will is if you have young children, children still at home. Because one of the things that happens if both parents pass away while the children are still at home, that if you don't assign a guardian to your children in your will, the court will do that for you. And so it's important for you to consider, who would I want to raise my children if we're not around? Because certainly we would want to have them raised by someone who has that same Christian faith that we do. You don't want the court assigning your children to say to some relative who's not a believer, who's not a follower of Christ. And so that's a very important reason to have a will. Also, another reason to have a will is if both, again, of the parents pass away when the children are still young, to have someone to be able to oversee the child's inheritance. Because, you know, children, you give them $10,000, they might go buy a bunch of toys and candy, and that's not really the best use of that money, right? So you want someone to help oversee how the money is dispersed and when it is dispersed, and you can plan that out in your will, or in some cases in a trust that you set up. The person, and sometimes this might be a different person if you have a trust, they oversee the financial side. You have a guardian that oversees the taking care of the children or the raising the children. But then sometimes it's not even at age 18. You might specify that they get some money at age 18, some money at age 25, and not till age 30 they get the rest of the inheritance. You can work it in different ways. And all of these reasons are important to have a will in our day and age. 
Well, what I've described is similar to what Paul is talking about here in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. But there's one thing that's a little bit different here in this culture. In the Roman culture, a child did not officially become the son of the father until he reached the age of maturity. Now, there's some debate on what age that is, whether it was the same or the father in, in the designation could even say what the age of maturity was. But the son would not be officially recognized in that culture as the heir until this time. According to James Montgomery Boyce, under Roman law, there was a time for the coming of age of the son. At a certain time, set by the father, when he felt the son had reached maturity, the Roman child became an adult. When the child was a minor, in the eyes of the law, his status was no different than that of a slave. He had no authority on his own. He was not really declared the heir. He had no specific freedom. He could make no decisions on his own. But at that time of maturity, the age set by the father, the child enter into responsibility and relationship. There was a new sense of freedom at that specific time. At that time, he no longer needed any guardians, any managers. He could make the decisions himself. And so we see in the book of Galatians and in several places in the New Testament that until it was the right time for us, God gave us the guardian, the manager of the law to help us mature, but also to help us see we couldn't make it on our own. We couldn't have a relationship with God on our own. And so Paul tells those in Galatia and us today that we have been adopted into a vital relationship with God through Jesus. We have been adopted into a vital relationship with God through Jesus. And we see this in our passage today. The first thing we want to mention is this. That God desires for us to experience a vital relationship with Him through Jesus. Not just to say that we have a relationship with Him but to have a vital relationship with him. Verses 1 and 2 say, Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. And so in this way, the child and the slave are very similar. Neither has any authority in their lives. The heir is under guardians and managers. Similar to what we talked about last week with the pedagogue. The overseer of that child. The, the caretaker who guarded the child. This happened until the date set by the father. And so it was at that time that the son is declared the heir and can receive the assets of the father. And so Paul is using this picture to help us understand what has happened in our relationship to the law and then to God. It changes. With the coming of Jesus, he makes all the difference. We have new freedom. We have new authority. We have new responsibility. He writes in verse 3 that when we were children, we were held in bondage. There's that picture of slavery. We were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. Now there is much discussion about what he's speaking about here concerning elemental things of the world. The context helps us understand he probably here is not referring only to the law, which he's talked much about, but also to pagan practices that many of the Gentiles would have come out of in this culture. They would have been involved in these pagan practices before they were Christians, and now they needed to leave those behind. The elemental things may have been 
referring to earth, water, air, and fire. And the pagan practices emphasized these things. Might have been a part of their worship as they went through pagan rituals. But whatever these elemental things are, Paul is saying it's time to be done. We've outgrown them. We've outgrown the elemental things. It's time to cast them off. They should no longer be a part of our lives. We've been set free in Christ. We don't need pagan rituals. We don't need the Jewish law, he's telling us. Paul then tells us in verse 4, this beautiful verse that sometimes we talk about a lot at, at Christmas. But when the fullness of time came, the fullness of time, what an incredible statement that is. God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. What does he mean here, the fullness of time? Well, he's saying that everything came together. All of the promises from the Old Testament, all of the prophecies that the prophets foretold in the Old Testament, everything pointed to this one point in time that Jesus fulfilled. It was time for the Messiah to come. And we see that throughout the Old Testament and in the fulfillment of Jesus coming. That we celebrate at Christmas. For instance in Genesis 49 verse 10. Reads the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. Until Shiloh comes. He came in the fullness of time. The next passage. Daniel chapter 9, an intriguing passage. I know some of you have studied this. We went through Daniel uh, many months ago now. But it says this, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Now there are many references here to time periods. He goes on to say, So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And so we have throughout this passage references to periods of time. And there's a lot of detail and there's a lot of discussion about this passage. But what we understand is that God is speaking through the prophet Daniel to tell us when the Messiah is going to come. And so it's the fullness of time. As many understand it, Jesus came and began his ministry 483 years after the decree of Artaxerxes as directly prophesied here in Daniel. It was the fullness of time. How amazing it is that God planned it all out. This is what Paul is referring to in Galatians chapter 4. One more prophecy that we can look at is Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, which says, Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. Of course, he's referring to John the Baptist. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. He is coming. In the book of Malachi, well now it was the fullness of time when Jesus came. It was time for him to come. This is one of the reasons that we can have such incredible belief that the Bible is the word of God. It wasn't just didn't come by circumstance or happenstance. He came because it was God's plan. He fulfilled the prophecies. 
We can believe in the promises of God. Just as God fulfilled his prophecies in Jesus coming. Jesus speaks about this in Mark chapter 1. He says the time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so Paul is declaring again in Galatians 4.4 4, that the fullness of time has come. The birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus didn't just happen. It was all part of the plan of God predicted in the Old Testament, fulfilled in his coming. He is the Messiah. The only begotten Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. And on the third day, as the scriptures foretold, he rose. And then he ascended into heaven. And he will come again just as he has foretold. And the scriptures tell us. Do you believe that this morning? The reason we can believe it is not just because, oh, we hope so, but because God has fulfilled his promises in the past and he will fulfill them in the future. Aren't you glad of that today? <laughs> Come, Lord Jesus. He's our hope and our joy. And we can believe it because Jesus came in the fullness of time. We were under the law. We couldn't do it ourselves. The law showed us that we were sinners. We couldn't justify ourselves before God. The law showed us our imperfections. But what we could not do, God did. God did for us. He sent his son to redeem us. We couldn't do it for ourselves. So he bought us back. He saved us from the penalty of our sins so that we might walk in newness of life. And so through Jesus Christ, if we have put our faith and trust in him for our salvation, we are no longer condemned by the law because of our sins. He makes us new. He does a total restoration. story was told of a, a London businessman who was trying to buy a piece of property it was an old warehouse in a rundown section of town. And so the man who came to try and sell him this warehouse said, Look, I know this is, is really run down. It doesn't look really good. But I'll tell you what, before you buy it, I'll give you a good price. But before you buy it, I'll go in and I'll, I'll sweep it out for you. And I'll fix a few of the windows just to make it a little more, a little better. And the businessman said, wait a minute, you don't understand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to totally renew this building. I, I'm not worried if there's a little dirt or if there's a broken window. I'm going to make it new. You don't have to try and get, make it look a little better. I'm going to buy it and make it new. And that's what God has done for us. He redeemed it. You know, we sometimes will try and sweep our life out a little bit before we come to Christ. We say, well, I've got to stop this and I've got to start this. Maybe I'll, I'll go to church for a while or maybe I'll quit swearing or maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try and not, not lie anymore and I'll, I'll try and, and pray for my family members and then I can come to faith in Christ. No, we don't need to sweep out the building. We just say, I, I'm a sinner and I need you, Jesus, to redeem me. I can't do it myself. And so we say yes to him and he buys us back and he totally makes us anew. Has he done that in your life? Has he done that in your life? Jesus in the, is in the work of making us new. Are you a new creature in Christ? The first step in his redeeming process for us is that he sends his Holy Spirit into our lives. When he redeems us, he sends his Spirit. The Holy Spirit changes us. 
renews us, refreshes us. He enlivens our hearts. So we will say, yes, I am a child of God. I am a son and daughter or daughter of God. I don't have to live that old life. I can live for him now. That's what God has done for us. In fact, Paul is literally saying the spirit cries out from our hearts, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. It's that term of endearment like like a three-year-old child when daddy comes home from work who runs and greets daddy. One of the things I enjoy listening to... uh, Franklin Graham and Ann Graham Lotz for a lot of different reasons. I, 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 I enjoy their Bible teaching, but one of the things I always enjoy is when they talk about Billy Graham, their dad. They call him Daddy. Isn't that sweet? It's so sweet to hear them call him Daddy. We can come to our Heavenly Father and just say, Dad, Daddy, Father, I love you. I love you and I want to live for you. That's the reason we can do that is through the cross of Jesus Christ. And when we put our faith in him, he gave us his Holy Spirit. Now we have a relationship with our father who's in heaven. We're not slaves anymore. We're sons. We're sons. Heirs of God's best. Because of what Jesus has done for us. So let me ask you this morning. Are you experiencing that kind of relationship with Almighty God? That's amazing, isn't it? The creator of the universe says, Go ahead. Have an intimate relationship with me. Open up your heart to me. Tell me your concerns Tell me your sins. Share your love with me. Because I love you so much. We're we're not distant children that someone else is caring for us. No, we can have an intimate, close relationship with Almighty God through Jesus. Because God has given us His Holy Spirit when we've put our faith in Him. This is what God wants for us. And I hope you, you're, you're tasting that. You're walking in that in your life. But you know, as we look at the church today, we have to ask the question, why in the world is it that it doesn't seem that many in the church are really experiencing that kind of relationship with God? Well, Paul speaks to that. He says, we don't experience our relationship with God because we return to our old ways. We return to our old ways. He reminds the Galatians of their old vices in verse 8. However, at that time when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are no gods. Before they knew God, they, they were believing in other gods. They were not real gods, but they were following pagan rituals. He speaks referring to here he goes on in verses 9 through 11 says you ought to know better but now that you've come to know God or rather to be known by God how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again you hear the frustration what are you doing right You observe days and months and seasons and years referring to the Old Testament laws. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. He sees in the Gentiles, in the church, the legalizers, the Judaizers have come in and said, you have to become a Jew before you can become a Christian. And you have to hold on to those Old Testament laws. He he said, what are you doing? Christ has set us free. We don't have to go back to those old ways. He looks at the Gentiles. Who've gone back and and they're, they're 
dabbling in their old pagan rituals? He says, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Christ has set us free from that old life. We are new creatures in Christ. Whether Jew or Gentile, we're one in Christ Jesus. I want to talk to you for a few moments now about some of the problems we have. Both with idolatry and legalism. We see these in our churches today. So what are some of the idols that we struggle with? Some of the things from our old self that we, we sometimes go back to in our culture. Well, one of the things we struggle with, the idols of materialism. Materialism. God uses money in a variety of good ways and he gave us all things to enjoy. But it's easy, isn't it, to be caught up in the stuff of this world. And if we get caught up in materialism, it just leads to stress in our lives. We don't experience the joy of knowing Jesus Christ. And so let me encourage you, if you struggle with materialism, maybe it's time to cut up the credit cards. Just to say no, at least for a while. If you're struggling with ha holding on to money, Maybe you say, you know what, this month I'm going to give an extra gift to the church or to God's work because I want to make sure that I know in my own heart and I just want to say to God, God, you're first in my life. We struggle with the idols of materialism. We sometimes struggle with the idols of the flesh. Oh, sadly, the idols of flesh are wrecking many families many ministries today as followers of Jesus Christ we have to continue to recognize that battle and hold ourselves accountable and invite others to hold us accountable as well we need to use things like internet filters because our flesh is still struggles yes we have the victory in the spirit in Christ but we still struggle in the flesh and sometimes we go back to that. We can memorize scriptures that remind us that no temptation has overtaken us, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also that we may be able to endure it. See, God doesn't want us going back to those old ways, does he? And so he gives us ways out, but we have to walk in the Spirit. We can struggle with not only materialism and the flesh, but I think in this culture we really struggle with leisure and sports. It's a battle in our culture. It just keeps getting worse and worse. That leisure and sports are just taking over what used to be time periods that the church had in our lives. Right? I mean, it's a struggle. It's a battle for families today. I mean, if, if you were to go out to the soccer fields south of town on Sunday morning, what's going on? What does that say about our culture? It says God doesn't matter. God's irrelevant. The sports programs just dominate on the weekends. Sunday night, Wednesday night, it doesn't matter anymore. It's sports, sports, leisure, leisure, leisure. I enjoy sports. I, I grew up in sports. Our kids, some of them were involved in sports. We took vacations. I mean, they're important. It's, you need those breaks. But wow, we need to ask, is this taking over my life? Am I saying to God and, and my neighbors and family members and my kids that God's first? 
We can struggle with the idols of materialism and flesh and sports and leisure. We can struggle with the idols of entertainment. <laughs> Hollywood and, and the media just are there to shock us, to draw us in, aren't they? To get us going, to rev us up, to, to draw us in. And it's become so much that we, and even in the church, expect the church to do that for us. That Sunday morning is just a, a place to, to entertain and get people excited and, and, and to get them enthused. And we have to battle against what's going on in the culture to try and keep pace. But church is not to be a venue for our own amusement. It's a place to come and worship and a place to serve. To share the love of Christ with one another and then to take the gospel to all the world. If you're struggling with that, maybe you need to set aside some television time. Maybe you need to set aside going to the movies this week or whatever it is and say, you know what, I'm going to go serve. Because it's not about me. It's about sharing the love of Christ. And so you go to that nursing home. Or do you go minister at Orphan Grain Train or in some other way do a meal for the international students? Because it's not supposed to be about us, is it? It's supposed to be about following Jesus and loving one another as we share the gospel with the world. These are just a few things I think we struggle with, even in the church, and make idols of. But we have to remember that the church will not be salt and light if we become too much like the culture around us. We have to prayerfully ask, where do we draw the line? Where do we draw the line? We must consistently put Christ and the gospel first in our lives and in our families. And if we don't, who's going to do that? Because the world, your jobs sports, the media, they all will keep you busy if you don't draw the line somewhere. They'll just push God right out of your life. We've all struggled with that. It's so easy to stray in these idolatries in our lives. But let, let, let me give you a question that I ask myself. Do the people around me my wife, my children, my church family, do they firmly believe because of how I use my time and how I spend my money, do they firmly believe that God's first in my life? What about the people around you? Because of how you use your time, and how you spend your money, that they say, oh yeah, God's first in his or her life. We can struggle, even in the church, with going back to the old ways. That's what Paul's talking about here. But as well, he says, we can struggle with some legalistic attitudes. And so what are some of the legalistic attitudes that we face today? In some ways, this goes directly against what I just said. Okay? And before I go any further, I do want to say that I don't believe legalism is really the big problem in our culture. It is for some. But in the church today, I think we struggle more with the idolatry of the culture. I also want to remind you, and all of you who have been at church at for any length of time, no, I believe in spiritual disciplines. They're extremely important in our lives. 
because of our struggle with sin, there are times we need to just do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, not because we feel like doing it. The spiritual disciplines are very important in our lives, but we don't want the spiritual disciplines to become legalism. And so it's a fine line. It's, it's, it's a tightrope of balance in our lives. One of the things I believe that relates to what Paul is talking about here is we can become legalistic about the Sabbath. About the Sabbath. Now Paul in verse 10 refers to days. Focusing on certain days and festivals. And I believe the weekly Sabbath is included in this idea that they were caught up in going back and trying to fulfill the Sabbath law of the Old Testament. The Sabbath as well as the special Sabbaths of the festivals would have been included in what Paul was talking about in verse 10. But we have to remember that specific Sabbath laws were not carried over into the New Testament. It seems the early church recognized this because very early on, they moved their day of celebration from Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, to Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. They began very early on not practicing the Sabbath laws as the Old Testament required. We know that the practice of the Sabbath and Sunday, we, we most denominations took Saturday and made Sunday the Sabbath. We know very early on that Sabbath was very important in our culture. I mean, when the Puritans and pilgrims came over, they had many Sabbath laws. I mean, many communities, when America was founded, had Sabbath laws. And people got into big trouble in their communities because they did certain things. They, walked, they did too much work or they walked too far on the Sabbath. And I believe they did those things with a heart for God. They were, they were seeking to please God, but I think they were wrong. I think they were wrong. It's not as big a deal in our day, of course, in the, in the lifetime of some of us. I mean, our laws have changed totally. We used to have so much closed on Sundays, and it goes back to that Puritan culture. Not nearly as important today. But let me say this. We do need a day of rest. God's made us that way. And we do need a day where we set aside and say, yes, I'm going to walk with God my whole week, but I'm going to set aside some special time to come and gather with a body of believers and to focus on God and to grow in my relationship with God. He does command us to meet together for fellowship in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And so by me, don't, don't blow this out of proportion and say, well, Pastor Mike said I don't have to come to church anymore. Right? That's not what I said. We're commanded to gather for fellowship. But what Paul is saying to us, he says this also in Colossians, we don't have to follow the Sabbath law. We're no longer under the law. It was a shadow of for what was to come. Well, how do I know if I'm, if I'm being legalistic about the Sabbath? I think there's a couple different ways. I'm sure there's many more. But one thing is, are you taking attendance in your mind of who's here and comparing yourself to them? Judging. Now, we keep attendance because we want to you know, see how everybody's doing. Because if someone isn't here for several weeks, that says, I wonder if something's going on. Another way you can tell if you're being too legalistic sometimes is, do I know the joy of gathering with one another in the presence of God? Or am I just here out of guilt 
because I feel like I have to be here. Now, if that's the only reason you're here, keep coming. It's part of that spiritual discipline. I believe in the spiritual discipline is whenever you can to gather somewhere with other believers to worship God. I think that's important weekly if you can. But we don't want to be legalistic about it. Secondly, we can be legalistic about tithing. Of course, the Old Testament spoke a lot about tithing. They had to give percentages of, of not only their, their money, but their harvest. A lot of varieties of ways. But this isn't carried over into the New Testament. Now again, don't say, okay, Pastor Mike said I don't have to give money anymore. That's not what, what the scripture speaks of. What does the scripture say? It emphasizes in the New Testament that we give as an act of thanksgiving. With generosity even uses the word in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7. We give with a sense of hilarity. With excitement, with jubilation that we have the privilege to share to, to contribute to what God's doing and to worship Him in our giving. Remember, Jesus emphasizes the heart in all of these things. It's not about, okay, I obeyed the law, I gave my tithe, I've done enough, I don't have to worry about that. No, that's not what, what the Scriptures is speaking about. He's saying, are you giving as an act of worship? That's what God wants. Again, if we're giving and comparing ourselves to others and judging what others give, we may be giving out of legalism. If we're giving and we don't have that joy, or we're giving because we feel guilty if we don't, we may be giving out of legalism. Again, I believe that each Christian should have as a goal that giving at least 10% to God's work. Many of you give more than 10% of your income. And that's great. It's not so much about how much we give. It's the heart we give with. There's one more area I want to mention just quickly. This one's even hard for me to say. We can become legalistic about our devotions. Now, you all know how much I've challenged you over the years about being in the Word daily, okay? We need that daily time with God. It's like in any relationship, if we're going to grow, we need to have that communication. We need to hear from God through His Word. We need to spend time with Him in prayer. I am a firm believer in that spiritual discipline. But we have to be careful, don't we? We have to be careful. And so if, if we come to God's word and we say, well, I know I'm doing it more than she is. So I must be pretty good. And if we consistently, there are days when I come to God's word and I don't have the joy yet. I get the joy as I get into it, and as I spend time in prayer. But if we consistently come to God's word, and we're just checking it off our list and say we've got it done, and there's no joy there, we have to be careful. We may be doing it legalistically. I could speak so much more about each one of these because I struggle with them myself. But I just want to encourage you. Are you experiencing the joy of your relationship with God? Yes, we need spiritual disciplines in our lives because in our flesh, there are days we don't want to do what we should do. But we have to remember we're no longer slaves. We've been set free by Jesus Christ to enjoy a, a dynamic relationship with Almighty God. And so let me encourage you this morning. Allow yourself in a right way to be a child again in a relationship 
with your daddy. I'm not talking about the immature child who needs a guardian. But the carefree child fully in love with his or her heavenly father. Let his Holy Spirit transform your life. Remember he's bought you. He's forgiven you. Allow his spirit to cry out from your heart. I love you daddy. I want to sit with you. I want to share with you. I want to hear from your word. Don't return to those old ways. Serve him. Worship him. Read the word. Spend time in prayer. Share his love with others. Serve and minister to others in his name. Not because you have to. But because you're so filled with thanksgiving and love. For what Jesus did for you. Let's pray. How amazing it is, Lord Jesus, that you have set us free. That we can have a relationship with Almighty God. And Lord, for some of us here this morning, we're not experiencing the joy and fulfillment and peace in that relationship as we really should. And partly that may be because we've gone back to the old ways of life. Part of that could even be we've, we've tried to, to impress you with our own righteousness and we've become legalistic. And so, so Lord, we just confess that today. And we thank you that you have redeemed us to have a relationship with you. We thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit And so we confess our sins and we turn from our sins. We repent and we ask that you would fill us once again with your spirit and be in control of our lives, that we would just enjoy that relationship, that we would want to, to express from our heart of hearts love for you and thanksgiving for all that you've done for us. We do say that we love you, Lord. And we worship you. Thank you for your goodness. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.